Hello, I'm Marvin. Marvin? Yeah. Pleased to meet you, Marvin. I've come to tell you both how misguided you are. Mm Mm-hmm. You are... So why should we give you an opportunity to tell us how misguided we are? Surely that's already the display of love to you. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Well, we're allowing you the opportunity to have a voice about telling us something that we may not want to (laughs) hear. And that's an opportunity of love, isn't it? Certainly, we do not feel that you are terrible people, Mm -hmm. just misguided. No worries. And we believe that this is an effort of love that we are bringing to yourself, this message. No worries. I know you believe it's an effort of love, but love needs to be based on truth as well, right? So please... This is exactly the issues that we would like to speak with you about. Sure. Let's let's do that. You labour under the false assumption that you are Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And you know that that's not the case. Indeed, we know this is not true. How do you know that? We know the truth about Jesus and his life. How do you know that? Did you live in the first century? No, but we have studied the Bible and we have been... But why do you believe the Bible is a true record of the truth about Jesus' life? Because we have seen the, we have been witnesses to the benefits of the Bible. We understand that it has uh, saved many lives. But just because the Bible has benefits, it doesn't mean also that there's not errors in it. But we we know these things because we have developed our relationship with God. We understand that this is the truth. But if you had developed your relationship with God, you would know who I am. And this is what we must tell you, that mm-hmm. you are not Jesus. Yeah, I understand. That's what you want to tell me. But you have no I'm evidence to prove that I'm not Jesus, firstly. Secondly, you weren't alive in the first century to know whether I'm Jesus or not. And I can easily bring you some people who were alive in the first century who knew me if you wish to have some actual evidence presented to you. And thirdly, the Bible is not God's word and the Bible doesn't contain any truth about God or much truth about God and so therefore is flawed in its, in its, in its creation and also in its execution. And now you have demonstrated that you did not wish to hear any message from us. You are only no, defensive. No. You are only telling us things and we are here to tell you something different and you will not hear us. Yeah, but I could say the same to you. So what shall we do? We shall leave then. Well, I think it would be better for you to take up my offer. If, if I am the person and I'm claiming to be, I should be able to present evidence to you that I am. And, and if you were open and actually willing to examine the evidence, then you might have to come to a different conclusion. And I put to you the reason why you don't want to examine the evidence is because you don't wish to come to a different conclusion. And that and that is not having an open mind or an open heart. Like if if I have the ability to bring to you people who were alive in the first century who could prove to you who they are, people who wrote the Bible that you but this is fallacy. This is not how, how, how is it fallacy? anyone can masquerade as anyone. I doubt that very much because you can question them. If you can, if 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 you claim that anyone can masquerade as anyone, then there are literally millions of people who masquerade as me, and I, I agree. But we know the real Jesus. We no, know you don't. You've never met him. He's in our hearts, and no, we but understand. You've never met him. You've never personally met the real Jesus, even though we do not wish to speak to you. We're leaving. No, but see, this is why. This is what you do: is you come, express your opinion without examining the evidence. That's what you do. And what I'm suggesting you are a rude man who will not listen to reason, and this is the problem. This is why you You will never find God or the truth because you are arrogant. With me, with any reason. You have not given me the chance. You, you haven't. All you want to do is present things from the Bible, and I'm saying to you that I can bring to you people who are actually there. I am saying to you that there are lives lived in evidence of the benefit of the Bible. That we have a relationship with Jesus, who is God, and we. I'm li- sorry, I can't agree. 
I can't agree with any of those things. And we know that. This you, is your problem. If you had met the real Jesus, you would never believe he was God. See, what I'm saying to you is, is that I can present evidence that you do not want to examine. And you've got to have a look at why you don't want to examine actual evidence. Babe, they, I, can't, I can't do it. They're, I just I find it's really distressing. These guys are around me all day, every day. I can feel well, it. Well, you know, they can come and speak to us, but we're not going to let them put... I'm not going to put up with this kind of, this kind of display of unreasonable behaviour from you. I'm not going to put up with it. If you're going to come and speak with me, you're going to have to be logical and reasonable. And one way to be logical is to actually accept my offer of giving you evidence. They are not going They're not going to. I know you're not going to because they you won't. are so afraid that you're actually wrong. And that's the problem. That is the problem. Because I'm not, I'm not afraid that I'm wrong, but you are afraid that you're wrong. I felt them before. There's a lot of fear in them. Mm. But I think and you I could understand. reach some if you heard what... But I don't know then if that's them impressing that on, on if me. If I heard what? If you heard some of their beliefs and reasoned with them. like they, Because they're not going to see anyone. They're not going to see anyone. Why not? I don't know. <laughs> What's the point of listening to reasoning that I already know is false because I was there, because I'm the person that they... Are talking about. There is little point in listening to reason that is false. I'm happy to present, listen to reasoning that is true, and listen to reasoning that is logical. I'm happy to actually even engage some some people in the spirit world that can actually help inform them as to more truth. There are people that have passed over many years before they have, and who actually lived in the first century and who actually met the Jesus that they claimed they know and who was in their hearts. And it would make logical sense to actually meet these people and discuss this with them. That's what would make logical sense. They don't want to talk to anyone but you. Well, it's point, the only reason why they want to talk to me is to come and abuse me and I'm not putting up with that with them. I'm perfectly happy to provide evidence and I'm perfectly happy to bring to them people who know the truth about the first century events because they were there. And they should know enough about the spirit world now to know that just because things are written it doesn't mean that they actually happened. They should know enough about history and what is written in history by now. They're not, they don't want to contest that with you. They want to contest the doctrine of the Bible and that it works. Well, I don't, I don't feel that... I feel that parts of the Bible certainly work but all of the Bible cannot work because some of the doctrines of the Bible are actually misguided and wrong particularly the doctrines about God now have they ever seen a hellfire for example they believed on earth that was a hellfire have they ever seen one they've seen worse I know they've seen so worse, yes, but have they ever seen a devil? Have they ever seen a devil tormenting people in a fiery hell, which is what they believed when they were on earth? Have they ever seen that? Yes, they've seen people in torment and a devil tormenting. They haven't seen the devil, though, have they? They've seen many such devils. Is that not the case? Yes. So there is no single devil that is tormenting people in hellfire. But this is not to say that these are not agents of the devil. So you've never met the devil? No, and nor do we wish to. And neither has any other person in the spirit world ever met the devil. I can bring but this does not mean that the devil does not exist. For he is, a, he is a tricker and a deceiver and so no, it is possible. No, the devil possible. cannot exist. The te- Why the, can it not if exist? If the devil exists, then God can't exist. Why? Because God, if he is a God of love, would never have been able to create such a being knowing full well that such a being would come about through his creation. And yet so many things have come about through his creation that are evil. No, they haven't. They've come about through, the per- through people's creation. And yet did not God give us will? And that it, so therefore it is an extension of his creation that evil things should happen. Yeah, but if you go into the higher spheres of the spirit world, you'll never see any of these things. 
Oh, babe, I can't do this. Then, then uh, it's not nice. I, I find this not nice. Well, how else do we deal with this? I don't know. Well, you're going to just sit there and put up with their projections every day. Yeah, this is why I wanted to talk to well, them. But why they're, don't you just speak? they're just belligerent, babe. They don't even they're not even talking to you. They're just shitting at me now. And well, you, you see, now you're being very unloving to the person who's given you the opportunity to speak to me. And that is a that is an indication that you do not practice what the Bible actually teaches. In the, in the Bible, in Matthew, it says that you must love your enemies. And if I'm your enemy, you must love me. And you're not being loving to Mary now, nor are you being loving to me. So, you know, at some point you've got to come to see that you're not actually practising the things that you say you are practising. In addition, you're unwilling to look at evidence that can be presented to you, which is illogical. It's illogical to be unwilling to look at evidence that can be presented. You'd be far better off looking at evidence before you form an opinion. The issue you have is that you've already formed an opinion before you look at any evidence. I have spent much, much of my life examining the Bible, so I already have looked at your evidence. You have spent none of your life examining any of the evidence that I could present to you about it being different to what you believe. Let us then just discuss one uh, issue that we feel demonstrates that you are not who you say you are. Mm -hmm. We have observed that you teach that there is no absolution from sin. Correct. And Beside from repentance. This, is not, this, this demonstrates that you are not Jesus because this is, Jesus did die for our sins. No, this is what you believe. But if, again, you went back to the first century and talked to people who actually listened to my preaching to them, you would find that I never taught such a thing and such a thing never arose in my mind to teach. But this is a, this is a, a beautiful truth that has saved many of us. It hasn't Terrible saved you Terrible torment at all. in hell. It hasn't saved you at all. You know what has actually saved you? is your willingness to practice ethics and morality, which is not what you're currently practicing with me, by the way, but your willingness to engage in an ethical and moral life has, is, has been what has saved you. But it certainly has not saved you in the manner that I have described. You are not at one with God and you are not yet in the eighth dimension of the spirit world, in the celestial heavens that I talked about, where you would have many mansions. How many of you live in a mansion? These are things that I spoke of in the first century and yet you, you don't live in one right now. So, so it is a, this was a, a metaphor, a no, figurative metaphor, a metaphor for the beauty of our soul and the possibilities of heaven. I'm sorry, but it was not a metaphor. And the beauty of your soul would be a measure of your surroundings. And currently you are in poor surroundings. And that is an indication of your soul condition. This is what I spoke of. In the you are an angry man. Listen to you. Angry, angry, angry. No, I'm being firm with you because you just want to come here and attack me. Oh, and so when it is firm coming from you, we yeah. can see you are angry. <laughs> and then you laugh to cover it. You laugh to cover the fact that you are angry. Yeah, how do you know that I'm angry even? Just because I state something firmly. Because we can hear it, we can hear it, no, we can you can't, see it in you. You can't see anything in me. To be, honestly, you can't. You know that. All you can observe is my behaviour. You can't actually see my spirit body. You can't observe it clearly. When you compare my spirit body with others, what do you see? That you are one of these agents of the devil. You are so tricking the devil is an agent of light now, is he? Because I'm brighter than most other people you see. And that's a it direct some, quote from your Bible. It is some trick that you are playing. How can I play a trick and become an agent of light? It is just something that you are wearing. Babe, you can't walk away if I'm recording. I'm sorry, I, I'm in a lot of pain. Yeah, I can feel you. Just you got to stay with your emotions, though, don't you? Well, I don't know how their emotions are so forceful. I feel frightened of them, and yeah, th but this why is do what you feel happens. frightened of them? Oh, In the end, you know, they are just people who need truth, and 
you know, they are unwilling to examine it and we need to state to them that they are unwilling to examine it. I would love for them to be willing to examine it, but, but in the end, if they can't examine the truth, then it's impossible to teach anything. Like, myself and Mary were both there in the first century. We know what happened. It's impossible for you to convince us otherwise. So, so why not either give up trying to convince us or at least examine the poss- potential of what we're saying? Oh, that it's possible to leave me alone here. Yeah. Well, they're not going to leave you alone while, you allow, while you're afraid of them for a start because oh, yeah. they just enjoy making you afraid. But also they're not going to leave you alone while they think they've got something to say and I feel given the opportunity to say it and then let's be done with it if they don't want to examine the truth, right? We... Uh, you have the opportunity here to examine the truth. You have the opportunity to have people from the first century who actually lived then to come to you and speak to you openly and honestly about their personal experience and yet you are denying that opportunity. We will not accept this introduction until you answer some questions. As but why should I answer to your any skin? questions if you're unwilling to accept the truth. Like... We will meet these no people. We feel confident that our, our beliefs will not be altered by meeting these people that you wish for us to meet. But firstly, we would like to ask you... you Wouldn't it be better first to meet the people and then your whole set of questions that you would like to ask may actually change? But it... We need to address for your own sake, for your own sake. For what, 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 for my sake? The nature of your sin. You are sinning every day and this is bad for no, you. No, I'm not sinning every day in this manner. I, I certainly might sin in other areas, but certainly on this not matter about my identity, I'm definitely not sinning. And in fact, if anybody's sinning, you are. How is it that we sin? Because you believe that your Jesus is God and I'm saying to you quite categorically that Jesus is not God and it's also a blasphemy towards God to believe that a man is God. But this, there so is... You are sinning every single day. I could claim the same thing you're claiming. That's what I'm saying. What's the point in having a discussion if you're not going to examine the evidence? I can make the same we... claims that you're making. You see, you cut us off all the time. Hmm? So... It's we, we feel that there is much beauty in the teaching of the, the sacrifice. I don't feel there is much beauty in it. Why not? Well, if I can explain. Firstly, you're saying that one of God's sons has to take the sin of all of the others of God's sons and daughters. Now, if you had a child of your own or a group of children of your own, like let's say you had five children of your own, and... Four of those children did things that were bad quite frequently and one of those children always was trying to do things that were good. Would it be fair for that particular child to take the sins of all of the other four children? Would it be fair that the parent punishes the child that is good for the sake of the children that are bad? Okay, so Marvin has gone to, more to the back and there's a woman mm-hmm. now, I, I think her name is like Daisy yep. and she's, she is the one who asked that last question. It's a good question. I'm more interested in this. It's a very good question. Can you send the reasoning of my argument? Yes, but I still feel that there is great beauty if, if you I took the mother of feel? those children for her to sacrifice her life for those children, would that not be an honourable and beautiful thing? Only if she was sacrificing for the sake of truth and love and not for the sake of error. And was not Jesus no. sacrificing for you're the saying, sake? You're, you're saying that Jesus sacrificed for the errors of others. I do not understand this distinction. Well, there's a huge distinction. For example... If a, if a person has been a good person a lot of their life and another good person comes along and the, the second good person has the opportunity to give a gift of the sacrifice to the first person because of their goodness, then that would make a lot of sense, would it not? But if the person has been bad all of their life 
a good person sacrificing himself for them would only cause them to continue being bad in many cases. But this is how I this I feel quite attached to this teaching. Can, can I explain because why? Of, may I ask one question? Sure. Uh, it relates to the grace that God displays, and we are bad inherently, and God loves us. I can't so agree why that you are bad inherently. Can I explain why? Because yes. God never creates anything that is bad, ever. But we sin, we have sinned. Yeah, because we've chosen to sin. There's a difference between a choice to sin, which is driven by emotional damage, usually that comes from our parents and grandparents and through a long lineage of people who have chosen to sin. And that's different to actually how God created us to be. In the Bible, you remember that I said that a person must become perfect as their Heavenly Father is perfect. Right? God created us perfect and we chose to sin. And that is very, very different than being born into sin or being inherently sinners. But then are you saying to us that God does not love us unless we become perfect? No, I'm saying God always loves us, but God's laws are trying constantly to bring us into a state of sinlessness. This is why I gave the illustration of the prodigal son. And yes. If you remember the illustration of the prodigal son, yes. remember the prodigal wanted the, the father to give him his inheritance. Yes. And his father gave him all the gifts of his inheritance, which the prodigal then went off and squandered. Yes. Now, the father would have been well within his rights to completely disown the son, could he not? Yes. But what did he do? He, he gave him more. He gave him his inheritance and then when he returned, he threw a party for him. Yes, but there was something that happened in between. What happened to the son in between? He, he, uh, his heart altered. And in what way did his heart alter? He, he, yes, you could say he became uh, repentant or humbled. Yes. Humbled. Now, did he need an intercessor? to come back to his father. Did he need no. a mediator? No. So what was I trying to illustrate there? The father is God, is it not? Yes. It wasn't me because I was the one describing the illustration. It wasn't Jesus. It was God that it was being talked about here. God and the child was being related to all of us as God's children. Yes. Now, this, this illustration proves that there is no intercessor between God and his children. And the only thing that God asks us or asks from us is to take notice of the things that we've done that are out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then we automatically receive God's grace. So we do not receive it unless we repent. No. We do not receive... God we are not loved by God. If God always we loves repent. us, but we receive grace, which is a different aspect of God's love, than just the love that God has for us every single day. You see, that's why I said to people in the first century, God makes it rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. What I meant there was that God loves all of us enough to give us what we need for our day, what we need to survive. But if we want to have a personal relationship with God, then we need God's grace. And to, to encourage, to, to actually engage God's grace, we need to have a spirit of repentance. We need to start to examine the things that we've done wrong that are out of harmony with love and we need to feel about them. We need to feel sorrow about them and a desire to change. That, and this didn't need a mediator. It didn't need somebody to go between. It just needs us engaging this feeling we've got. That's all it means. But we do not see Jesus as a go-between. We see Jesus as an aspect of God. I and we that. see Jesus' sacrifice as a, as a demonstration of God's, the, the love that God has for us, that, um, that he would... I, I understand all of the theories about what you... Have I do not understand what you present. I understand that too. But I under, please understand that I have spent many, many years of my 2,000 years of life discussing with Christians 
their belief systems about my sacrifice or supposed sacrifice. For myself, Daisy, mm -hmm. I feel that I cannot cope. I cannot. I cannot uh, reconcile any type of faith with the, the symbol of the sacrifice is central to all of my faith, and I cannot. And you see, this is the point that I would like to make to you. The symbol of your of your faith should actually be about God's love. I see the sacrifice as about God's love. No, no, I'm sorry. You see it as evidence of God's love. Yes. But I'm saying to you, there are far many more evidences of God's love than a fictitious one that has been created by people in order to create some kind of adherence to a religion. God has displayed, and, a, and you will learn this as you progress if you decide to, and if you decide to investigate more in the spirit world, there's what I'm suggesting to you from the beginning, you'll find that as you engage this process with God, that the truth will come to you of how good God is. And God, God is far better than what you believe God to currently be. God does not require the sacrifice of one good person in order to prove his love. God desires the love of all persons and to give love to all persons. And there's a very big distinction between those two forms of operating. She's very distressed. I understand. This is why I wanted to discuss with you your she distress. Can't understand. Like, it can't make sense in I her head that, what you're saying. But the reason why I want to discuss with you, your, your, the reason why you have accepted these belief systems is because there are very many emotions in you that cause you to accept these belief systems readily. One of these emotions is that you strongly desire another person to take responsibility for the sins you have committed and chosen to, to, to take part in. No, it is... I, I know I am a sinner and I know I have done much sinning. So why but should I, you not be the person who has to undo it? If you I are the person who sinned, uh, then surely it would make sense. The logical conclusion would be that sh the person who sinned should be the person who needs to undo the sin. And I'm suggesting to you that the way to undo the sin was the way that I taught through the illustration of the prodigal son and that is to become repentant for the sin. I believe in the power of repentance. I believe, I believe that I must repent for my sins mm -hmm. but I feel that I cannot well, you don't ever be worth... My blood to repent. I was alive when I made these statements. But See, this please is can I... Yeah, she okay. needs time to get her words out. Okay. Sorry. I understand the teachings that she's trying to present to me. She, she's she no, she's trying to say she's so upset, babe. She's crying. She's mm -hmm. like, how can I get to God? I'm never going to be worthy of God. I know I have to repent. I know I'm not good, but That's I can't the without the sacrifice. I can't ever connect to God. That's not the case at all. It's actually easier to connect to God without the sacrifice. How how can it be? How can I how can I do it? Well, this is why I'm, in this why I'm referring to the illustration of the prodigal son is this. I gave the illustration of the prodigal son when I was alive. I was teaching people before my death how they could connect directly with God. Now, if you think about it logically, it makes no sense that I was teaching something that was not possible until I died. So what I'm suggesting to you is that I was teaching a principle in the prodigal son illustration, I was teaching a principle which was available to every single person on the planet and every single person in the spirit world before I died, which means that my death wasn't the means by which this principle could be obtained. The only thing that was required was my repentance. That's, that is all, my repentance. And so it is much more simple to have a relationship with God than actually believing in the sacrifice of Jesus because it, all that is required is the principle of repentance which you already know. It is this principle of repentance that you already know that is, has established some kind of a relationship with God. 
And what I'm suggesting is that it needs to be taken further in order to be establish a complete relationship with God. So what should I do? Well, you do not need to worry about the belief in the sacrifice of Jesus because there was no such sacrifice. And in addition, you do not need to worry about belief in Jesus as a person or as God or any of those kind of things because all of those things are not true. The only thing you need to engage with are the principles that I taught while I was alive. And if you think about those principles, they are the principles of repentance and forgiveness. Now, if we examine these two principles carefully, the principle of repentance is all about coming to learn to feel sorrow about the things that we have done and have a strong desire to change our actions. And to do that, we need to actually feel the reason why we took those actions that we took. So that's the principle of repentance. The principle of forgiveness is to examine why others did things wrong to us and then go through the process of forgiving them for such actions. That's the principle of repentance, of forgiveness. And it's only the two principles of repentance and forgiveness that will help us grow in our relationship with God. These are the primary principles that I was trying to teach in the first century. In addition to that, there's only one other thing that we need and that is to have a true longing for divine love, God's love to enter our soul. When we truly long for that love to enter our soul with sincerity and what I mean by with sincerity is that we need to have an openness to give up any falsehood that we might believe even though we think it might be true. We need to have a willingness to experience our emotions just like you were doing when you were crying a willingness to experience your emotion and long for God's love to enter you and while this love enters you, you, it will help you deal with all of those particular issues and on top of that, it will bring truth to you, more truth than you currently have. That is all that you need to do, nothing else. They are the only things. Having a longing for divine love, a longing for divine truth and humility to experience everything you need to experience to do so. So is it possible then that my belief in the sacrifice has prevented my... I believe, I believe in the principles of forgiveness and repentance. I know. Not in a dissimilar way than you, that you have described them. Exactly. I know that I am not perfect in these things. In fact, I feel... I need to work on these more, but... I agree. <sighs> Why is it then that I do not know God better? It's because you've been unwilling to engage the principles of repentance and forgiveness and you want to hold on to belief systems that are false about God. So in my belief in the sacrifice, if what you are saying is correct, that it is, it is such a difficult thing for me to consider, but if I consider that it is not correct, could this one belief prevent me from... Growing closer to God? Certainly. Can I explain how? how? This belief in the sacrifice is, is, has, is, has many flaws, if you think about it logically. The first flaw that it has is that it, it, is that it, is that it believes that God is not a very logical being. So let me present the argument for you to, listen, to, to have a feel about. It's saying that God created flawed humanity. In other words, it created people on earth who had flaws. And this it created seems people so who evident because it seems that yeah, I've I, never met a perfect person. I, I agree because you never met me in the first century and I had become perfect by the time I began teaching. But aside from that, there has never been another perfect person on earth. You can meet perfect people in the spirit world and these are some of the people that I would like to introduce you to Mm -hmm. but because you've been unwilling to meet them because of your belief systems it's very hard to introduce you to them. But if I can go back to my argument. Yes. God never creates a flawed individual. God created perfect human souls. Okay. Now, if... 
under your reasoning, God created a flawed humanity. Him requiring that somebody dies for a flawed humanity is really requiring somebody to die for his imperfection, for God's imperfection, because God created the flawed humanity in the first place. But this seems like a way to demonstrate (coughs) his love. Wouldn't it be better that God created a perfect humanity? Wouldn't that be a stronger demonstration of God's love? But then would we, we would not feel that we need God and we do need God. Well, that, no, the reality is that God has given us the choice to either decide to want God or not. But if we were perfect, we would not feel the need for him. No, that's not true at all. I know many perfect people, which I could introduce you to, who feel a strong desire for God. But it's a desire and not a need. But we should feel needy for God. No, we shouldn't feel needy for anyone. God, God desire. This is a, this is one of your misunderstandings about love. Love is not needy. Love is giving a gift to another person without need. No, I mean it is arrogance for us to think that we may, that we may, that we may be fine without God. Well, God created a universe in which we can be fine without God to a certain extent. But it is not true. I look around. No, I could also bring you some people who have no relationship with God, who are in a much better place than you yourself are current is currently, and who believe themselves to be perfect. They they don't have a happy relationship with God because they don't have a relationship with God. However, the people are who are the happiest in the spirit world are those who have a relationship with God. The people who do not have a relationship with God can only progress to the sixth dimension of the spirit world, which is the place of natural love, perfect natural love. That is not the place of perfect divine love. The people who progress with God progress infinitely. The people who and, and actually live as immortal beings. The people who progress without God do not live as immortal beings and are not even really... Uh, they are aware that they are not immortal. But I could bring you both classes of people, if you wish, so that you can compare the difference in their feelings and attitudes. But see, again, this is a matter of investigation that you can, inca- that I, you can do I in the spirit world. I believe I, I should like to meet some people closer to God than myself. Certainly, yeah. Would you like to meet some of my friends? Would you like to know some of the disciples from the first century? Yes. Okay, well, let's uh, ask a group of them to come to you and then we can speak about, to them about things. So who do they say they are? Peter and John. Peter and John, yep. And you know them as the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John, right? Yes. Hmm. And what do they look like to you? Do they look like devils? No. No. They are kind. Mm-hmm. You can feel the love coming from them? Yes. You can feel their compassion? Yes. What would you like She's to just ask? She's just sobbing them? now. Just sobbing. Hmm. Well, some of the others of you might like to ask them some questions. It's pretty quiet, actually. They're afraid, but they're, they're just stock silence. The okay. whole group of can them. Can we deal with the fear? Bit, they're not freaking out, but they're just like, whoa. Well, can just we happened? can we ask you why you feel afraid? These uh, seem to be kind people standing in front of you. It's it, is this someone else now. It's mm-hmm. a man. Mm-hmm. Oh, hang on. Uh, Harry. 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 Yep. Yeah. It is that we feel a sense of shock and 
we are uncertain what this means. We but cannot when question. When you say a sense of shock, what, what's the feeling that you have? We did not anticipate people of such beauty mm-hmm. being able to visit us. Mm. We have never encountered such people. Mm. And there is a reason why they've been unable to visit you until now. What is this reason? It has been your resistance to their visit. You remember the feeling that you've often had is that the devil can turn himself into an angel of light? Yes. And remember what I said about that in the first century. Do you remember the things that I said about when people said to me that I am a fa- my, my father is the devil? What did I say to them? What did, or if you don't feel it's me, then what did your Jesus say to them? There's something about the light that, I don't know. Yeah, I said that it's impossible for the devil to be an angel of light, didn't I? I implied through my teaching that it was impossible Yes. Because the devil would then be against himself. Yes, and that this this was impossible. Yes, yes, mm. you said this. But we we again felt this belonged as metaphor and that mm-hmm. it is possible to uh, masquerade. Most of the things that I said were said directly. And the reason why they were said directly was because people were often asking questions like you are and I gave them direct answers. I never tried to confuse them. I always tried to make it easier for them to make choices and decisions based on truth. So I never tried to confuse them with, with teachings that, that they had a lot of struggle to understand. We need time. We cannot... It, this is a shock for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can I make a few we recommendations? We wish to meet these people. Yeah, that's my first recommendation: yes. to meet with these people and ask them direct questions about the first century. They have the ability to show you pictures of what happened, to show you like movies of what happened, like you know the actual events. They have the ability to communicate with you about what I taught, and these people know the Jesus of the first century. So they are able to answer many of your questions. There are many others too who could come. There are many women who were also in the first century who could come and help you understand the truth about what happened in the first century. Please understand that many of the teachings that you have have got from the Bible will able to be incorporate be incorporated into the, into the truth because they are truths. But there are also some teachings that you have had that are not true and these teachings have stopped you from progression. Your mistrust, for example, of brighter spirits is an example of something that has stopped you from progressing. Yes. Remember I said in the first century that a person who grew would let their light shine. Yes. And I meant this both literally and figuratively. Literally, a person who has more truth in their soul is brighter than a person who has less truth in their soul. So therefore, there is more light coming from them. John and Peter can show you the light that came from Jesus in the first century. Everyone's just crying now, babe. <laughs> mm-hmm. um. We keep talking, but they're not saying anything. That's either. okay. They can show you the light that came from Jesus in the first century and they can also themselves demonstrate a lot of this light because they are themselves now in the condition that I talked about in John chapter 17 when I said, I would like my disciples to become at one with me and at one with God just as I was at one with God. And these men that are in front of you are now at one with God. So they have the ability to show you what it means to be at one with God. So I would recommend that you allow yourselves to ask many questions. 
Peter and John would be very, very happy to answer all of the questions that you have. They'd be very happy to show you the truth of what happened in the first century and also show you the truth about how to have a growing and continually growing relationship with God. One that grows infinitely. Yeah, they they they're not in any question about Peter and John. They're just all, they're all just sitting around crying. So mm-hmm. that's okay. Just because in response to the love. So I think. So we I would can encourage to people to not run away now from the environment that surrounds Peter and John, but rather to to go closer to them and just stay in this state where they feel. And then Peter and John, once they have finished feeling some of their feelings, Peter and John would be very, very happy to answer many of their questions. I am also completely at your disposal at some point in the future if you want to talk again and answer many of your questions. But I want to point out one thing though. It is not right to browbeat a person in a place where you are insincere about finding out truth. And this is what I would encourage you to do now, is to be sincere about finding out the truth from these people that stand before you. Rather than telling them all the time what you believe, they understand what you believe because they've observed many Christians for thousands of years and they know what many of the Christians believe. These men understand what you've gone through. They understand why even you've found it easy to accept the teachings of Christianity as they've been taught to you by people who also did not know. So my suggestion is to be open and willing to discover the truth. And then I'll be perfectly happy to discuss with you any questions you have about my character or behaviour